time of the Nicene Creed through the Reformation and into the modern age where a broad denominational landscape represents the Church of Jesus Christ, bodies and groups within Christendom have laid claim to being the true Church. When heresy has infiltrated a denominational body and a split has occurred, both the leavers and the left have hoisted the flag of being the doctrinally true and righteous bride of Christ. Even the cults have claimed the label of true church. The Latter-day Saints, the Watchtower Society, even the Unitarians identify themselves as the true church of Jesus Christ. I suppose it's true that anybody can call themselves anything, but being the true church means something. Let's look into what defines the true church in this episode of Walk the Walk. As the church was born and grew into its third and fourth hundred years of life, the priesthood and the theologians of the church set about codifying the nature of orthodox belief. The result of this work was a series of creeds, um, statements of the contours and boundaries of Christian belief. The first to be widely shared was the Apostles' Creed, a statement of faith that many Christians still recite today. It goes like this, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Added to this statement of Trinitarian belief is a statement about the nature of the church, defining the true church, describing it as the holy Catholic church. The Catholicity of the Church is emphasized in nearly all the creeds and shouldn't be confused by an association with the Roman Church. The word Catholic, always in lowercase in the creeds, simply means universal. In other words, the Church of all people. The Nicene Creed, quoted at the beginning of this video, added some clarity to that simple description, naming the body as the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. In these five words, we have more than just something to put on a sign. We have the marks of the true Church. Each one of these descriptors reveal a significant way that the early Christians understood the nature of their community. One, for example, emphasizes the fact that all Christians are part of a single body. We commonly identify the church in terms of our local affiliation, but it's important to remember that we are but a part of a a worldwide, of a universal body. The description of the church as holy speaks not only to the church's character uh, as a result of Christ's redeeming work, but it also gives definition to our lives as the set-apart ones in that church. This call to holiness should permeate the belief and the practice of the church. The Catholic Church is an inclusive church, including all believers under its banner. A renewal of this understanding would go a long way in a modern age, facing all the disruptive cultural trends that the church does. The Catholic Church is to include all believers, regardless of race, ethnic origin, heart language, or gender. The final mark that identifies the true Church is that it is apostolic. This is a doctrinal identifier, and and that means that the faith that the members of the Church hold to has continuity with the faith practiced by the entire historic Church. When you say the words holy, Catholic, and apostolic, and understand what they mean in the context of the church, it seems to be a a very broad umbrella that covers an awful lot of ground. This is good and, and it's bad. Understood in the sense of inclusivity, it arrests our worst impulses towards ethnic division. 
rather than seeing churches across the landscape identified by shared country of origin, the church should labor to be the kind of community that all believers can call home, regardless of their heart language. On the other hand, this same big umbrella can unwittingly support our worst consumerist tendencies. When we see all the churches as more or less alike, we don't see the need to commit ourselves to being a part of a body, and we shop around for the local church that satisfies our desires. The result is that Christendom has these bands of wandering Christians forever on the move, rather than devoting themselves to the hard work of being holy and Catholic. Holy, Catholic, and apostolic are good categories for us to use in evaluating the church, but what do they look like? What does it mean to be holy? How do I know if the beliefs of a church are orthodox? Looking at specific practices within those churches gives us a more familiar way of dividing true from false churches. Since the Reformation, there have been three marks that identify a true church. Number one, the Word of God is preached and heard by the congregation. Going hand in hand with that, the ordinances, some might call them the sacraments, are properly administered. And then finally, church discipline is exercised. John Calvin said it like this, Whenever we see the Word of God purely preached and heard, and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution, there it is not to be doubted a church of God exists. The content of preaching is the first mark of a true church. In many modern meetings, messages of therapeutic deism are given to the undiscerning ears week after week. Listeners are fed a steady diet of messages about how to have a better marriage or what to think about the day's political issues. And the preacher uses the Bible to provide this kind of scant uh, proof texting in support of the topic. The kind of preaching that Calvin referred to is exposition of the Bible. God's people are given what he says, book by book and chapter by chapter. This type of sermon is, is not passive. It's not just given out. To say that preaching is heard emphasizes the importance of a discipled body receiving that preaching. The true church devotes itself to discipling its members such that they're able to rightly divide the Word of God. And because of that, the congregation is able to discern the accuracy of what they're being taught from the pulpit. A second mark of the true church is that the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's table are properly observed. Now this can be a challenge to judge because the church has developed multiple streams of belief about both of these practices. The difference in baptism, for example, uh, puts the, the pedo-baptist against the credo-baptist. And then it extends further into the mode of baptism, whether we sprinkle or we favor full immersion. Now listen, these are intramural differences but are not the measure of a true church. We look for the thread that ties the true church together in this ordinance, and that is that it identifies, that is, baptism identifies a believer and their faith in Christ to the larger body. In the same way, the practice of the Lord's table and his presence in the elements differentiate the beliefs of parts of the body, but again, Taking one's seat at the table of the Lord's feast is an act of obedience practiced by all in the true church. The final mark of a true church is the most difficult one to see in the modern era, and that is that biblical church discipline is present. The modern church that sees itself as, as a voluntary association of autonomous members, everybody's doing their own thing, also sees minimal moral accountability to God and to each other. Any mention of church discipline brings up these images of the, you know, scarlet letter. It's seen as this archaic practice. But this is a dangerous position because without discipline, the marks of holiness, orthodoxy, and unity rest on precarious foundations. 
The true church expects holiness in the lives of its members as defined by scripture, and its members demand adherence to the historic beliefs of the church. Discipline isn't just punitive in either case. It is reflective, corrective, and protective in the practices of the true church. There's no doubt there are true and false churches in the world today. And we should err towards charity as we identify which is which. Jesus knows who his people are. Many churches today are leaning in a liberal direction, softening historical doctrines that have defined sin for centuries. Are these false churches? Are they rightly handling the word of God? Or are they deviating from historic orthodoxy? These are the type of clarifying questions that the Christian must be able to answer when deciding what church is calling them to pour their lives into. Find a true church, pick up your cross, and give your life to the work of the gospel. God's richest blessings, my friends.